Perfect. Yat is going to get to join my hot seat. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for waiting around. Sorry also for everyone having a little wait there, but we promise it's worth it. Right, Yatsu? Of course, let's see. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so why don't we start with sort of finding out a little bit about what you think we should be looking out for in the coming two days. What are the key things you would look out for at an event like this? Well, I mean, I would say generally for 2023, as opposed to the coming two days, our general focus has been around blockchain gaming for the last couple of years. And we actually think that this particular year will be the way, uh, year in which blockchain gaming is going to grow really fast. That's because a lot of the investments uh, that we and others have done in the last couple of years, those products are launching this year. Uh, and just to give some stats about the general gaming industry, there's over 3.4 billion people who play games today. It is an industry that is larger than music and film combined. It is the predominant form of culture for youth today as we know it. And as a result of that, they're also very familiar with a concept of ownership of digital items, even though they don't own them at this moment in time. So blockchain and particularly non-fungible tokens will help change that. The other area that we think is going to be really interesting for 2023 is Asia at large. If you take a look at the regulation, regulatory changes that's been happening in Hong Kong, in October they announced uh, basically a friendly uh, digital assets policy. Now we have, I think, close to five or more ETFs. Uh, in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange that are sort of um, around crypto. Uh, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority launched a green, tokenized green bond, and currently it's in consultation for retail trading in crypto. And I think a lot of people sometimes confuse or think of Hong Kong as being China, but Hong Kong's role has always been as the intermediary of China. Right? It's, not, it's the only place in which you can do RMB exchanges. It's the only place where you can, as a, as a, as a Chinese person, can invest overseas, for instance. Um, and so that's what Hong Kong's role has always been in the world of finance. And so we think the same will happen with digital assets. Uh, Japan has made NFTs, the metaverse, uh, and Web3 part of its national agenda. It was announced. Right? So Asia is growing really, really fast. And so our emphasis and focus has been uh, you know, partially on gaming, but also on the Asian markets, and broadly speaking, the growth of the industry. Uh, and Amoka itself focuses on what we consider crypto culture. Right? We think that's going to be the key driver as it has for traditional economies, also in the world of Web3. Yeah, as we were actually discussing a little bit earlier, gaming really is key in trying to push the whole industry to gain a global market. If we want to reach the masses, gaming is going to be the pinnacle of pushing that, really. It is. And one other thing to also understand is that gaming is one of those digital first type of uh, sort of uh, products. If you think about what gaming has put forward, the reason we have graphic cards like you know from Nvidia or back then ATI now AMD or you know Razer keyboards or PlayStation or Xbox or Nintendo actually it wasn't the fact that the the hardware came first it's actually gaming came first initially and they brought these industries to us and this brings me to maybe the other point around why we're focusing so much not just on gaming but broadly crypto culture which is represented with NFTs right our perspective is you know if you call bitcoin a store of value we consider NFTs as a store of culture. But if you consider, consider culture, culture was the second largest driver of economic activity in the US and in generally in most of the world, it represents you know, sort of you know, single digit percentages of the entire GDP. But if you look at, for instance, what culture does, it's not just what you pay an artist or a creator or a game developer or a designer, it's actually all the industries that spawns from it. Netflix, HBO, cinemas, Sony, you know, um, Disney, Warner Brothers, like all the giant companies that you see around the world, all the activity, even Instagram and so on, they all emerge from one thing, which is culture. Our engagement, our time, our creativity is fed that way. And maybe they're not all sort of financified in the way that we think of it in terms of crypto, but it's how we all engage. And that's why we also believe crypto culture is the way which will bring mass adoption because most of the world are thinking in terms of culture. Culture isn't just, you know, um, items you purchase. Culture is tradition. Wedding rings are culture, for instance, right? Uh, whole household traditions, what you purchase uh, is culture. Everything that you wear is a form of culture. I mean, you don't pay, you know, the amount of money that you pay for your clothes has nothing to do with its utility, right? If you buy, for instance, an NFT, most of its value is actually virtual in construct. But if you buy, for instance, you know, uh, an expensive fashion bag, like a Birkin bag, for instance, or, you know, some, some, some luxury shoes, for instance, how much of that value of what you're purchasing is actually physical in nature? Nothing, 
right? Otherwise, we'd all be driving black cars and we'd all be wearing shoes that have the same color because none of the shoes that we buy will make us run faster. In fact, there's a funny thing. Somehow, it seems that the more we pay for a shoe, the harder it is to walk in them. But, you know, that aside, actually, it's the point. Is it, is, it is a statement about who you are. It's your identity. Mm -hmm. And that's what culture is. And that's what we think and how we think most of the world will, bring, will go into Web3. That's very interesting, actually, to think about culture's importance in, within this industry because people see it very technology-based and it actually seems like it has a, a, a segregation away from culture when actually someone like Anamoka Brands are really pushing to build on that and create more culture in the industry. You know, I think that when you think of the history of broadly blockchain and crypto, it did start very much in a finance lens. But finance in its own way is a culture in and of itself. Right? There's a political lens to, 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 uh, to finance itself. Free markets, liberalism, capitalism, it is another kind of culture as well. And most of that is, of course, the, you know, capitalism is the culture that is driving most of the world. But we take different lenses to it. But, you know, I, I, was, I was once asked about, you know, for portfolio companies and projects like, you know, there seems to be very little activity in things like the Sandbox or Decentraland, right? Um, and I said, well, there's actually, you know, 4 million wallets, 250,000 users using it. But there's only maybe thousands of people trading. And the issue is this, that the thousands of people trading doesn't denominate the population and the cultural activity and the consumption that happens inside the application. Because just like in the real world, most of the world doesn't trade either, right? You don't buy a house to sell tomorrow. Some do, most don't, right? You can't denominate the size of an economy. We think of blockchains, layer ones, and the metaverse as economies. We can't look at the economic activity entirely based on how many people trade on Wall Street, right? You know, you have maybe a single digit percentage of Americans trade on Wall Street and the vast majority basically living their life and their culture and their traditions, building their economies. And what would you say excites you most in this space? Because you've been in this space a while. So what really drives you? So the thing that really drives us is that we think that this is a framework of reframing capitalism and more equity. And I mean that in the sense that we're now able to participate in a shared network effect. The world has a problem right now. Capitalism in our perspective is in a traditional sense broken because it has a, you know, a monopoly, a concentration of wealth. When I was in the US during COVID, I observed an interesting phenomenon, which is that, you know, I, I wouldn't believe this having not stayed in America before, that most youth actually under the age of 30, there's statistics about this now as well, have become negative on capitalism, which explains the rise of things like, you know, Bernie Sanders and the perspectives of socialism in America. Now, that's not to say that certain forms of democratic socialism isn't necessarily a bad thing. That's not what I'm saying. But this idea that capitalism isn't uh, an opportunity for young Americans comes from the fact that capitalism hasn't worked for them. Right? And so they've gone negative towards that. And that's partially because shareholder capitalism concentrates wealth. If you look at the platforms, the wealth of Facebook or the wealth of Apple is concentrated in the hands of shareholders and in the hands of, you know, obviously the management. But the people who give it its network, its value, like the users of Facebook, actually don't actually enjoy in any of its benefits. Even though if we all stopped using Facebook, for instance, actually, what is the value of Facebook? Nothing really, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't the platforms share in that value? And that's just the way that the economic system was designed at that moment in time. But with Web3, with blockchain, we actually get to participate in the growth of that network. If you end up owning Bitcoin, you're not actually, in the simplest terms, just owning an asset. You're participating in a network. If someone develops a product that uses Ethereum or Bitcoin, you actually share in the success of the growth of that particular network, independent of the fact that, you know, you maybe did something because you were able to just participate in it. So that means that the relationship in Web3, in the digital landscape of Web3, is that every uh, sort of customer consumer is now an owner you get to be a part owner in this digital network. You get to participate in the network and in the growth of that. And to us, we're all the creators of that data. You wouldn't have self-driving cars if we didn't drive the Teslas out there. And as we drive them, we give, I think it's 40, something like, um, I, I think it's like four, it's some insane amount of data every day that we basically send over to, uh, to Tesla as we drive the car that gives them the intelligence that makes the car smarter so that eventually it can do what it does today, self-driving cars. So really, why do you pay so much for this car when actually you're giving value back? Shouldn't you participate in that? 
And that's what we're so excited about what you know, blockchain can do because it, the ownership of these assets are no, longer, um, are no longer controlled by a central platform. It's controlled by the very community that actually gives it value. And when we're talking about a sort of adapting in the space as well, you're, you mentioned Hong Kong, but how do you adapt to the different markets out there? Well, I mean, I think one of the things is obviously each market may have slightly different regulation. One of the advantages about, I guess, non-fungible tokens is that they're treated very much in the same vein as art or digital assets and they're not considered systemic. So purchasing and being active in that space isn't um, sort of part of the same regulatory framework as perhaps, you know, the typical token. Um, but I would say one thing, regulation from our perspective has been resisted, not specifically as we think from our own industry, but actually often by the regulators themselves. Because if you remember, you know, three, four years ago, regulators actually were often thinking that this isn't a thing. So if it's not a thing, then you can't regulate it. In fact, if you regulate it, you actually give it institutional validation. The moment you regulate something, you're saying it's real. And so you can see the countries that are regulating it are not taking the lens of this is bad. They're taking the lens of this is real, this is serious, and we need to provide a framework that makes it safe for people. And once you do that, as we see in places like Dubai and now Hong Kong and starting in Japan, for instance, then you basically bring in more people and you see the growth of an industry. I mean, just look at this conference, right? I mean, if, uh, if Dubai was not welcoming, if Vara didn't do what they were doing, then conferences like this wouldn't happen. Economic activity wouldn't grow from that. And so we see, we see the same opportunities happening in this space. But it is, of course, different from place to place. But eventually, I think, you know, as regulation begins, then it actually just opens up the space for everyone. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining me on stage, Yatsu. That everyone in this room, please give a round of applause for Yatsu for joining us today. We haven't got our timer, so I think, I think we've hit our, our, our limit of chatting, but it was such a pleasure to get to speak to you. And as we started speaking about regulation, we've got a lot more coming up about that as well. So everyone, please, thank you so, thank much. You so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank Thanks. you.